All right, everybody good to go? If you have your video on, give me a thumbs up <laughs> or a thumbs down if you don't want to go. All right, good. Cool. So welcome, everybody, to another edition of Rust and Tell. Um, we're very happy to, to have you here. Uh, welcome to all those who have been at a Rust and Tell before, either in person or online. Um, and welcome to everybody who is new um, and might be joining us from Berlin or beyond other places in this beautiful world. Uh, a little bit about the organizers. Uh, I'm Ryan Levick, and you can find me uh, on Twitter at Ryan underscore Levick. Um, and uh, I'll introduce myself a little bit later um, when I give my talk. And hi, and I'm Bastian Gruber, and you can find me on LinkedIn, <laughs> not on Twitter. And I'm happy to chat about like yeah like the language and if you want to use rust in a web development environment i'm always happy to talk and chat about your project so a little bit about the concept of uh, the meetup uh, rust and tell is for beginners to experts to share your struggles ideas hacks projects anything and everything uh, whether you're an advanced uh, user of Rust or just beginning with the language, it doesn't matter um, whether you've been programming for 30, 40, 50 years or just learned how to program yesterday. We would love uh, to hear your story. This is really a space for the community to learn and grow together. Um, and uh, we are willing to take any and every talk and happy to help you grow your, your talk, even if it's only uh, the beginning of an idea. And um, we also followed the Berlin Code of Contact, um, which is now the World Code of Contact. If you join from, from Emma somewhere else than Berlin, it's Emma basically just to treat um, the people here nicely and with respect and treat yourself with, with um, respect. And if you encounter someone which is harassing you or is making mean comments or something else please feel free to get in touch with us we take those things very very seriously um since we are online now um we have a different emma setup than in person so we are emma using zoom and the zoom chat so emma during the talks you have the chance to ask any question and you can just um, type them into the zoom chat we also have a, have a matrix chat or what is called now element chat. And um, after the second talk, we will go into the Zoom breakout rooms, which means we will have um, three or four rooms um, where you can join and turn off your camera or you can just chat with the other people about anything you want. And um, you will get a notification after the second talk if you want to join this room and in case you don't want to um, feel free just to wait until the third talk starts. Um, we will also um, stream this live on our YouTube and the recording will be afterwards on, a, on YouTube as well. And I think we, I said, uh, we're not uh, streaming it okay. live on YouTube or streaming okay. it on uh, another platform. We can paste the link to that into ah, okay. the, to the Zoom as well, cool. but the recording will be live on YouTube and for those of you in the future okay. watching this on YouTube, hello. <laughs> hey, and yeah, and um, feel free to type any question you have in the chat rooms. Uh, so just going back to what this uh, meetup is about, we really want you to um, come and give a talk. Uh, we are always open to um, helping you with your talk. So please, 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 even if you do not have um, a fully formed idea of what you want to talk about, feel free to get in contact with us um, through Meetup or on Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever you happen to find either of us. Um, we are happy to work with you um, and we would love to hear from you. And yes, we really do mean you. And also a thank you to Jan Eric for helping us once again with uh, the setup. Um, as always, he has been uh, very kind and patient with us as uh, helping us with all of the technologies of streaming that we still not gotten a handle on. So thank you, Jan Eric, for your, for your help there. Um, we really appreciate it. 
And um, the, the talks for today, um, the first talk will be from, uh, from Pius, who joins us from California. And he will talk about implementing fast route planning algorithms. Um, the second talk will be from Stefan. He joins us from Hamburg. And he will talk about um, games and Rust, Rust and games. And then the last talk will be from Ryan himself. Um, he will talk about Windows in the early days and how to do something with Rust, I guess. Something along these lines. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> Trust me, it's going to be fun. I can see people <laughs> running for the hills now. No, it's going to be fun. <laughs> We're going to get into some fun stuff. All right. Uh, so with that, um, we are done with the introduction and then we're going to hand it off to Pius for the first talk. Okay, hello. Uh, good evening. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you're able to see my screen. Uh, is it visible? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, okay, let's start. So again, good evening and thank you so much for coming. Um, in 2015, Nick Cameron, a research engineer at Mozilla working on the Rust compiler, on his blog called Feather Pit Musings, wrote a blog post that started with this sentence. Graphs are a bit awkward to construct in Rust because of Rust's stringent lifetime and mutability requirements. And uh, internet being internet, in responses to in response to Nick's blog, an anonymous stranger wrote, "It's not that hard, guys." After Nick's post, there were several similar posts about graphs in Rust. Probably the most notable of them being written by Nico Matsakis called uh, "Modeling Graphs in Rust Using Vector Indices," and uh, all of these posts try to answer the same question: What is the correct representation of a graph without violating the Rust border chicken rules? Now, this was five years ago. Where do we stand today? The most popular grade providing the graph data structure appears to be one called PetGraph, which is downloaded about 9,000 times every day. But does having one excellent general purpose graph create suffice for all use cases? Very likely not. Let me introduce you to one such problem. Um, but we'll have to start from the first principles for that. So let's look at what a graph is. So a graph is composed of nodes, edges, and edge weights. For the purposes of this talk, we shall consider that uh, only simple graphs, so self loops and parallel edges are not allowed. And we shall assume that edge weights are always positive integers. Though we shall relax this assumption um, later. Now the problem we are trying to solve is to find a shortest path from a source vertex, vertex S to a target uh, vertex T on the graph. And that looks simple, right? Uh, well, it's not so simple. Here's the real problem. Shown here are two road networks of New York City and the San Francisco Bay Area, which both have about 300,000 nodes and 800,000 edges each. And we need to find the shortest path between any two vertices on these graphs. And the queries are required to be run in milliseconds, or if possible, even lesser than that. The word shortest here is to be taken with a grain of salt because the paths don't have to be necessarily the physically shortest. Uh, for example, if you set the edge weights to the time taken to travel between nodes, then the paths we get could be the quickest paths, right? So the classic solution to this problem is, of course, Dijkstra's algorithm, which is from his 1959 paper called A Note on Two Problems in Connection with Graphs. And uh, no, that is not a typo in the title. It is the archaic word of this word connection. Um, I'm glad that computer science has reached a milestone where we can find papers with archive words in the titles. Uh, let's see what the algorithm looks like. So here's a graph from our early example where we had, uh, where we have added the source S to a set of frontier nodes and the green labels on every vertex represents the best known distance from the source S to that vertex. Now we start relaxing edges. On each iteration, we take the shortest edge incident on the frontier so in this case, it was three. And we update the green labels on the nodes adjacent to the new frontier if needed. So for example, uh, 
in this uh, in the example we took we have updated the label for this vertex because we found a new shortest path from s to this vertex where uh, the uh, vertex are on the top so we this uh, the label uh, reduced from infinity to 5 whereas the label for this vertex did not change since the new path that we found to the vertex is actually uh, longer than the uh, path that we already knew we keep doing this till uh, we run out of nodes or till we find the target t the complexity of this algorithm from the original paper is order of p square but uh, better algorithms have uh, are known now and uh, if we use fibonacci heaps then the best known uh, complexity of this algorithm comes to be order of v log v plus e now we can do slightly better than this, this. Um, for an intuition, let's say what happens if you start frontiers, developing frontiers from both the source and the target. So you develop a frontier from the source that goes in the forward direction and another one from the target in the reverse direction. And wherever the, both the frontiers overlap, we can find the shortest path using the overlap in the frontiers. This version of Dijkstra's algorithm is called the bidirectional Dijkstra's algorithm. Now let's see how well it performs in practice. So here I'm running the Dijkstra's, the, a, by, a version of bidirectional Dijkstra's running on, implemented using Rust, and I'm running it on the uh, road network of the Bay Area. And I will be running it for 100 random queries that are generated on the fly. Okay. So since the queries are randomized, we will see some minor variations in the time it takes per query, but we can see that it takes approximately 10 to 15 milliseconds per query, right? And for every query, we are settling approximately 100,000 nodes. And this is not good. We can do something better than this. So let's talk about contraction hierarchies, which is what this talk is all about. So in 2006, the Center for Discrete Mathematics and Theoretical Computer Science at Rutgers took up the shortest part problem as a challenge. Research groups were asked to submit papers, and out of it came a whole host of speed up techniques that could be used to make the shortest path computation faster. One such technique is called highway hierarchies. Now, the idea is simple. The researchers posited that not all edges in a graph have the same importance as a road network. On one end, there are local edges that have low edge weights. And on the other end, there are highways that have very high edge weights because they connect nodes that are very far apart. Routing now under this model becomes like driving. To travel long distances, you want to hop, hop on the highway as soon as possible and keep driving on the highway, only descending to the local roads when you reach close to your destination. And this is exactly how our search works. And if you have ever wondered why Google Maps takes you to highways, even for short distances, this is exactly the reason for it. Uh, the most popular variant of this approach is called the contraction hierarchies, or CH, where instead of ranking edges, we rank nodes. So we assign a scalar importance to each vertex. Then we order the vertices in order of increasing order of their importance that we just assigned. And finally, all of this leads us to the applying the operation that gives CH its power, shortcuts. For example, for a vertex V, if U to V to W is the shortest path from U to W, then we can add a short, uh, then we can add a shortcut U to W. This operation is called the contraction operation. And the benefit that it gives us is that all Dijkstra searching, all Dijkstra searches that reach the vertex U can now uh, reach the vertex W completely bypassing the vertex V. This gives us a uh, nice speed up in the runtime for the Dijkstra's algorithm. So in the running example that we have taken so far, if I contract the, if I, the uh, numbers in red are the importance of the vertices, uh, and if we, uh, if we apply the contraction operation to all the vertices in this graph, we will find 
that we have uh, we will be adding two edges so one from 11 to 13 and another from 12 to 13 and in this case we have assumed that uh, all edges in this graph are bidirectional now here's something to think about we added edges to the graph and we made the graph bigger in order to compute the shortest paths faster there's also some thing that we need to change with the query algorithm so contraction hierarchies is kind of like building an index on the graph it's not exactly like building an index but it's like adding more information to the graph that can uh, supplemental information to the graph that can help your dexterous searches run faster but uh, we cannot run regular bidirectional dexterous instead uh, for the query algorithm we need to uh, restrict our, our algorithm to run only in directions so the forward search goes only from vertices that are half lower importance to vertices that have high importance and the backward search goes from vertices that have high importance to those that have lower importance right so in the example that we took the forward search goes from one to all the nodes where the neighboring nodes are bigger than one uh, are bigger than the neighbor uh, are bigger than the neighbors and the backward search goes from 13 to 4 because 13 is the largest vertex. 13 is the largest in terms of its importance. And then uh, the search goes from 13 to all the vertices that it can reach where uh, the importance is lower than the neighboring vertex. Right? And now you might think, what does any of this have to do with Rust? Give me a moment. We shall come to Rust. I promise. Now, remember how we started talking uh, in this talk about general purpose graph libraries when we started? The problem with those libraries is that they often don't implement specialized algorithms such as contraction hierarchies. And that is understandable. These libraries are designed to solve a broad set of problems for most people, and implementing such specialized algorithms is clearly beyond their scope. But there's something that we can learn from them, which is how to represent a graph edges, how to represent vertices, and how to represent edge weights, and how to represent the operations that are allowed on the edges and the edge weights of a graph. Right? So for example, let's look at C++. So how do we represent graphs? The correct answer to that would be adjacency lists, unless you are representing very small graphs, which is not the case, clearly not the case, uh, in the problem that we're trying to solve here. Right? So Let's look at a standard C++ graph library. Let's look at Boost graph library. Okay? And as soon as you uh, start looking through the Boost graph code, the first thing that strikes you is that the library is chock full of traits. For everything from deciding whether the graph is stored as an adjacency list or an adjacency matrix, to deciding whether edges are directed or undirected, everything is handled using traits. And even more important than that, the operations allowed on different types of nodes, edges, edge weights, are decided using traits. And traits are not a first-class citizen in C++, which makes these implementations um, probably easy to use when you're using them, something like Boost, but really difficult to do it yourself. And this is where Rust steps in. Now, traits are a first-class citizen in Rust, so it is no surprise that Rust makes it incredibly easy to implement generic graphs to data structures. Uh, for example, we have here, I implemented, uh, this is the code from a project that I implemented, which is that you can implement the trait uh, and a trait of an edge. So every struct that implements this edge trait can be used as an edge. And then a graph contains a vector of a vector of an edge of a set of uh, structs that implement the edge trait. Right? Now, the bigger thing here, to notice is that it's extremely easy to say to apply constraints on the type weight here. So it's easy to say w colon weight rate plus add output equals w plus debug. This way, what we have constrained our type uh, edge weight, uh, we have constrained our edge weight to always be of a type that implements the operator plus. Doing this in C is neither fun and nor easy. I mean, uh, this would require something like a boost, the, the boost concept check library, but that is an additional dependency that uh, needs to be pulled in and maintained over time. 
which is again not a very pleasant experience. Um, so I have been working on this for some time now, for about a year, and uh, the results that I've been getting are pretty good. Uh, and let's see. And of course, uh, since it's trust, the performance is also pretty good. It's only a, so there's ease of use and there's performance as well. So let's look at how good the performance is. This is again running uh, 100 queries on the same graph that we looked at last time, but you can easily see that uh, the runtime has come down for every query from 14 milliseconds to 17 microseconds. And the reason for this is because we, can, we have drastically reduced the search space, the average search space for the Dijkstra's queries that are running on the graph. Right? We can try running it a couple of more times just to be sure that uh, these randomized queries were not a good case for us. And again, we are at 18 microseconds. And let's try one more run. That's it. So we are seeing an order of magnitude difference using these algorithms. And uh, yeah, so in the end, I mean, in conclusion, I would like to say that Rust is excellent for implementing graphs. The performance is good. Uh, if you are familiar with, uh, get familiar with traits. And if you think, uh, it's, it makes it really easy to uh, implement the same algorithm and then use it again and again for different types of edge weights and edges and all of the operations become really easy while the performance is maintained at the same level. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. This was fascinating. Um, I'm looking for questions and I'm the chat and the Zoom chat have no questions. People were either lost or still amazed. <laughs> um, do you have this I'm somewhere in a in a productive environment or could you take out some parts of it for a real world application? Uh, well, this is actually a library that I'm planning, that I'm using for a paper that I'm, uh, we are planning to write next. And uh, when the paper comes out, we'll probably open source the library as well. Okay, There's already cool. a, a really, really nice contraction hierarchies library in Rust called fast underscore paths. So if you need it in production, then uh, maybe I would recommend checking it out. Checking out. Cool. Did you compare the, your results with, the, with an implementation from C++? Yes, I did. And we are either equal or better in all the benchmarks we have. Okay, nice. Okay, thank you again. And now off to you, Stefan. Yes, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Can you see? Okay. Yep. So, I think it's already two months since my last uh, Rust and Tell presentation. And uh, this, this time it will be quite different um, because I'm actually talking about my day-to-day my -day business, which is uh, in games, actually. I've developed uh, games for the last 13 years and um, over the last one and a half years, roughly, it's more and more happening as in, in Rust as well. So, um, when I was asked to, to uh, quickly maybe um, talk about this topic, I, I gladly accept it because uh, of course, this is something uh, that's, that's dear to my heart. And um, uh, not, let, not that the talk from last time wasn't as well, but um, the kind of graphics uh, fidelity that we had, had last time in my uh, little GUI um, TUI ap uh, application well, is maybe lacking when we are talking about modern games. So um, today we are talking about uh, games that we are building as a company. And uh, the first one of these is actually called Stack 4, uh, which we started working on um, beginning of last year. And uh, we can get a quick glimpse here.
So yeah, Stack 4 is a 3D game um, of Connect 4 and uh, it's out uh, for mobile in Canada right now in a so-called uh, silent launch. So basically trying to iron out the last couple of bucks and uh, seeing how people react to it. And um, it's on, uh, it runs on the platforms of iOS and Android. And uh, the reason why I picked Rust in this particular case was that I wanted to have a uh, authoritative server implementation um, that was supposed to implement the actual game logic of Connect4. Um, and I didn't want to duplicate basically code between front end and back end. So um, the uh, engine that I'm using in this particular project is uh, Unity. And um, I think replicating the kind of complexity that, that this sort of uh, uh, mature engine gives us was definitely out of scope for this project. So we stuck to, to what we were uh, used to, which is uh, using such engines. And um, I still wanted to use the opportunity to, to benefit from, from Rust's uh, features in a sense that I was really focused on performance when it came to the AI implementation. And maybe you can look at the actual tech that, I'm, uh, that, that, that is used in here. So there is a core library that implements the game logic in Rust and that is used between, uh, shared between front end and back end. And uh, I mean, the, the, mo the, the major uh, reason for this, for this was uh, to have a fast uh, um, into, uh, uh, AI implementation, because that is actually something that I uh, knew from the past would be, um, could be a, a potential bottleneck uh, doing it in a, in a managed language like uh, C Sharp, which is the main language you're using when you're writing your game in Unity. So um, yeah, and the and the additional plus side for me was that I wanted to be able to check those uh, calculations on the back end and validate uh, that no one is cheating. So uh, it was kind of um, straightforward to to look for a technology that would be able to run on both sides. And um, you can see already uh, this is also using Go in the in the back end, and that is because. Back in uh, 2000 and, uh, and, and the beginning of 2019, when we started with this, um, the whole async await and, and backend uh, framework landscape for me was still looking too um, unstable, let's say, for me to, to really make the call to go full on Rust. So there's sort of a uh, step in between that we did for Stack 4 which is uh, that we are using actually uh, Go as the um, server implementation framework. And this is uh, also using the same C-based Rust library that the front end is also using. So sort of a hackish kind of thing, but it worked really well for us because the really performance critical code that needed to be as fast as possible uh, was still written in Rust and uh, benefited from all those uh, benefits that we got uh, from, from this full control over the memory management, for example. And we will uh, see a little bit more about that later as well. So the next project um, is called Tower Rangers. And uh, you can see some uh, moving animations in here. Um, this is a tower defense based mechanic. Um, so uh, you can see towers that are shooting kind of entities. And uh, this was a step into, into a much more complex direction with this project. Um, so it's much more interesting. I hope I didn't destroy any ears here. Um, it definitely was very loud on my machine. Um, as you can see in this in this short video, it's it's much more uh, interactive. There's much more going on. There's much more real time involved, and so it was a, a much more uh, interesting use case for us. And um, yeah, it's pretty much the same kind of approach that that I started out with here as in Stack 4 was to first figure out a, a core game logic that was written in Rust anyway, but then. I also uh, took the next step and kind of decided, okay, let's get rid of this whole Go thing. Um, we are talking about uh, middle of or end of last year. So for me, it was definitely interesting to, to start using one of those async uh, frameworks uh, in Rust and, and give this whole backend a complete Rust uh, kind of foundation. So um, this is what we, what we did here. And um, the project is still in prototype phase, so it's not uh, something you can play out, uh, out there, but it's something we are very interested in, in proceeding with. 
since uh, the whole technology behind it is, uh, is super interesting for us and uh, the kind of game mechanic is, is super promising because we are kind of, I, mean, I don't want to go too deeply into the game uh, design kind of uh, uh, considerations here, but for us, this was a very interesting co combination of two genres um, and something that we didn't see a lot out there in the wild. Um, but when it comes to the actual technology, was uh, was some some things that we that we stepped up from from the last project in this one, and uh, in particular, I wanted to highlight two of them, which is I mean, first of all, I mentioned it already. There is no Go involved in this project anymore, so the whole backend is completely written in Rust. Um, but there is a clear separation between the game logic um, and uh, the whole backend API uh, implementation because. The game logic again is also shared with the front end, so um, the the um, the complexity of this kind kind of game makes it uh, requires us to do a lot of uh, extrapolations on the front end side to be able to know what happens in the next couple of seconds in the gameplay without always synchronizing tons of of entities between uh, front end and back end, and so we kind of took this approach to have a deterministic uh, logic implementation that is run on both sides, basically, on the front end and the back end. And we kind of only synchronize between those two, the input events that are happening. This is kind of a standard approach uh, in gaming, uh, but it's, uh, it's something that made it super easy for us to reuse, uh, again, this kind of logic library on both sides. Um, but something that, that we did differently here, um, I wanted to highlight is using flat buffers for one. So in, con in contrast, uh, in the Stack 4 project that I showed you before, we actually communicated between the, the core library and the, the game or, or Go um, using JSON objects. That was all fine for, for this particular use case because it wasn't uh, that much data that needed to go uh, back and forth. And there's also much less input events that you actually need to, uh, need to synchronize. But because of uh, the, the fact that in this game, as you can see, we have many more uh, entities going on and um, they basically you, you have to be able to synchronize with, uh, with uh, up to a thousand uh, entities that could be uh, simultaneously on screen. And so what we are using here is a, uh, is a library called flat buffers. Um, there's an actual, actually a very, pretty nice talk from a meetup uh, in San Francisco, I think about it. Um, there's a Rust implementation for it. And what it essentially does is that it uh, allows you to serialize data by uh, mapping, basically by mapping uh, directly into, into the, the memory from different languages and to be able to interpret this memory uh, from different languages in the same way. So you don't have to uh, have, you don't have this whole overhead that you are using uh, when you're, that you're having when you're using JSON, for example. And uh, that gave us a nice uh, boost in, in performance there. Um, secondly, uh, entity component systems is, is a super big buzzword in, in the Rust uh, community. Um, and that is, I think, uh, that has two reasons. First of all, Rust makes it super hard to design your uh, whole entity relationships uh, differently. So ECS is something that is, is pretty straightforward. And there's also a couple of nice meet, meetup talks about ECS in general. I'm not going to go too deeply on those. But the, uh, the whole idea is that you are, instead of referencing directly between multiple entities, um, you have them all in contiguous uh, arrays, essentially. So it makes it uh, super easy and, and fast to iterate over them, which is one of the uh, predominant um, access patterns that we see in this, uh, in this sort of game that, that uh, Tower Rangers is. And um, it also uh, it, it allows us to, to also, from, uh, from another perspective, to architect the whole game in a, in a nice way where you can add uh, behavior to entities by basically just adding components to them instead of having this this weird class hierarchies that uh, that i'm that i remember from back in the past in c plus plus so um back in in end of last year what kind of backend technology that we use for the actual web api that was uh, rocket um and that is something <coughs> that I wasn't too happy with at the time because it made me, it forced me into uh, using uh, instable Rust or uh, nightly Rust. Uh, and uh, that's something I, I really didn't feel good about because there were multiple times that it broke my build pipeline when suddenly some nightly 
uh, releases didn't support um, the the version uh, some sort some version of some uh, some of my tools anymore. So that was definitely something I, I really uh, didn't like so much, and also the fact that uh, back in that uh, back in that time. Um, I mean, the, the stable uh, thing also changed, uh, I, th I think, pretty recently. But back in the, uh, uh, in last year, that wasn't the, f uh, the case. And also the, the fact that it didn't support async, which was uh, something that I really was uh, interested in having like um, to, to really save uh, and, and scale easier with my uh, backend implementation uh, on a very cheap kind of server infrastructure. Because uh, for us as a, a super small uh, company, it was essential to really not waste any money anywhere possible. And um, yeah, but we will see that uh, in our current project, we are actually using a different kind of solution that I'm uh, currently much more happy with. So that's why we're now talking about Wheelie Royale. And I show you a short clip again. Oh, this time without sound. Um, so yeah, the idea here is uh, it's a racing game. It's, it's super simple and casual, and uh, but it's still interesting from a technology perspective because you're competing against 99 opponents uh, at the same time. So you're racing against uh, other actual players out there. Oops, damn it. That's not what I wanted. Um, and the, this is called in, in, in our game world, there's a term called Royale mechanic for that because there's a couple of games uh, that, that, does, that do something similar where you're co competing against 99 uh, opponents until basically one is left and, and wins the game. Uh, again, this game is currently live in Canada in a test uh, environment. And um, yeah, and we are, have, uh, we are using a uh, similar tech stack to, to what, what I showed you before, but this time it's a, it's a game that, is, that was too simple at, uh, um, actually to also have a client side. So this is a purely backend uh, Rust implementation. Um, and the, the, the backend sort of uh, acts as a entry point to the database, when, uh, if you will. So we have a, a pure REST-based API. <coughs> We are saving all the data in uh, DynamoDB databases. So um, there's, a, there's a very nice crate uh, that gives you access to all those uh, AWS services. And for us, uh, a very scalable solution was using this DynamoDB. And um, there is actually uh, async wrappers for that. So that is all, all no problem. Same, same goes for Redis actually, that we, are, uh, that we have to use as a caching layer in between because there's a couple of access patterns that are, that are super expensive to, to always hit the, the actual database. And uh, it's, a, it's a very straightforward uh, approach to use Redis in between for that. Um, and again, there's a nice crate for that uh, out there. It's, uh, it's, it's all async, no problem um, to integrate into a Tokyo-based uh, runtime, which is the one that I'm going for in our current system. So I have no experience. Uh, I cannot uh, say much about uh, how the alternatives look like, even though I actually art. I, I actually am tempted to look into them because uh, Tokyo actually pulls in a lot of uh, uh, dependencies and a lot of bloat uh, right away. But uh, that is something, I guess, a uh, a battle for another day. But what I'm really uh, happy with in this backend implementation is uh, using Warp. Uh, that is something that I didn't have on the radar at least last year. Um, when I chose Rocket, so Warp um, basically provides you an async uh, 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 implementation for uh, for web servers. And uh, for me, the the kind of ergonomics in how you are uh, building up your endpoints and services and uh, how this whole whole thing is, is super modular was kind of uh, intriguing to me. And right now, I really am happy with this solution using Warp, and I'm uh, definitely going to go forward with that. Even though I, I must admit that those um, benchmarks that you can see on uh, uh, what's what's the site called? Anyways, so uh, it's it's definitely not the, not the fastest in those uh, in those uh, benchmarks, but you always also have to take those benchmarks with a grain of salt, right? And uh, for me, it was always um, more beneficial to go with something that is uh, that. Uh, that is maintain more maintainable and um, easier for me to grasp. And uh, maybe it's a little less fast, but I'm building, um, usually building stateless uh, backend APIs anyway. So that may, might mean that I have to run one instance more than if I had written it in, in Actix, for example. Um, 
So there's one particular uh, crate that I want to go into. Um, it's, it's a super shameful self plug, but it's something that I'm using in all of my uh, backend implementations so far, because we, uh, doing, we are doing, uh, uh, ma our major uh, uh, focus is on doing like multiplayer games, social games. So the idea is always to, to give you a really good feeling of, uh, of a community in the games and you, you want to know where those people are coming from that you are uh, competing against. And so it's a, it's a best practice sort of also in the, in the industry to uh, assign everyone the flag that, uh, uh, of their country where they're coming from so that you have a feeling of this international kind of challenge and, and competition uh, that you're engaging with. And um, for, for the longest time I was using uh, actually a Go implementation. And I actually used it in the, in the Rust-based uh, backends as well. Um, I just basically ran it in a Docker container as a microservice. And uh, uh, all that it gave me was a IP lookup uh, to a country. And I always felt bad about it because it was first, I mean, it was uh, not super fast. It was, uh, it took a lot of memory. So I actually paid more money than I had to, uh, to, to run this, for example, in a, in a AWS container. Uh, it didn't give me AP, uh, AP uh, v4 and 6 uh, at the same time. And it also had a shady sort of license where they always try to sell you up into some sort of priced tier where you had to, uh, where you could get more uh, accurate kind of results. And that is something that I really uh, had on my list for a long time to look into. So uh, in my last project, I actually found a solution on, um, on Crates.io that does this whole thing in Rust. But uh, um, for my, so to my surprise, it was way worse than what I that, than the solution that I had used in, in written in Go. So I looked into it, and uh, <coughs> it turned out to be basically the problem was that it was always keeping this uh, super unoptimized uh, sort of data structure in memory for the whole database uh, for the whole IP database uh, to look up into. And so I decided, okay, let's, let's finally do this uh, my, myself and, and implement it in, in the right way. Um, and I still want to write a blog post about that because it's, it's, uh, um, it's uh, now so much more performant and I'm, I'm really happy with the result. It supports IPv4 and 6 at the same time. Uh, it uses a completely free and, and royalty-free kind of database that, uh, that, is, um, that is provided by uh, all the different uh, ISPs out there where you can get the IP ranges and uh, the, the um, who is lookups behind that and the country as well. So in the end, I'm throwing out all the crap that I don't need and basically just reduce it for, for IP range to country lookup. And that is um, <clears throat> what you can now find also on uh, crates and, uh, and GitHub. And um, yeah, it's also using warp and it's, uh, it's super fast, even though every, uh, the whole database is, is in memory as well. But that is something that uh, really, uh, again, emphasized for me how easy it is to write uh, really performance systems in Rust where you don't have to jump th uh, through a, a ton of hoops to make this possible. Yes, the learning curve was, was kind of intense for me as well, but uh, that's something that uh, after a year, uh, I must say really paid, out, uh, paid off uh, quite well. So a couple of highlights why we are uh, happy with our decision to go for Rust. I mean, uh, obviously the C interoperability for us was uh, one of the major uh, factors, right? We couldn't be using Rust in an engine like Unity if there wasn't this sort of uh, opportunity to go through a C API. So that is something that, that really was important. Um, and actually in the end, uh, the fact that there's no real runtime and that it's super lightweight, um, allows us to, to use this uh, in, in every sort of place. And that is uh, the sort of portability that, that I was, for example, uh, that I didn't get, for example, when I looked uh, for, a, for a short period of time to do the same with Go actually back in the days. Um, yeah, of course, uh, implementing a, a complicated AI like we did in Stack 4 that goes through a search tree in, into the, uh, I don't know, 20th level or something to really be able to at least do super uh, uh, intelligent moves was something that was super hard to implement in a, in a, like, uh, a language with, memory, with, a, with an automatic memory management and garbage collection because you had to keep in mind so much stuff. You had to, uh, uh, to, to do so much things uh, to, to make sure that you're not allocating in places where you can maybe uh, forget about that it's happening there. And that is something that Rust really makes easy for you 
to not run into because I mean it's basically the opposite uh, uh, kind of approach, right? Where it uh, uh, shouts into your face whenever you do, you're doing something that um, that you uh, didn't want to do. And uh, yeah, this, the ergonomics and safety is something that's emphasized uh, in, in a lot of discussions about Rust. But for me, it really um, there's there's one example that I keep telling people, and it's it's funny because it kind of sh uh, came through in in the previous talk as well, which is uh, ergonomic for me uh, to to be able to still get benefits that other languages give you by doing like dynamic dispatch. Uh, uh, and, and, and Rust basically makes it easy for you to have this in, in a compile time level where you are, when you are looking at those uh, graph uh, traits that, that we saw in the previous talk, that is, that is a, a prime example for me. To have flexibility like you're used to in other languages, but have it at runtime with high performance. <clears throat> and yeah, I, I still wanna uh, also, I keep emphasizing, I think also in my last talk, Cargo and the whole community, um, uh, but it's still for me one of the reasons why I keep, uh, uh, I guess uh, not losing faith when I am when I'm running against the wall for the hundredth time in, in, a, in a rust problem because then I realize okay there's other solutions out there that I uh, that I can get my inspiration from and uh, and there's a super helpful community even when you reach out to those authors and, and maintainers and you, you always get help and that is something where I, which I also learned it, it could be much different in, in other communities or other language communities and um, I know it's it's sort of uh, uh, something people do is like highlighting some of the crates they really like and uh, I did uh, a I, I picked out a selection a little differently this time because I think these are my prime examples of underappreciated crates and uh, one of them actually could also be interesting for uh, to the to uh, my the previous speaker because it's actually an implementation of Dijkstra and also a ton of other graph search algorithms and um, it's uh, it's one that I picked because it has uh, it just has like 260 stars, but it's uh, it's the core uh, uh, library for for every game basically of, on our side that has any sort of uh, AI implementation because it's a it's a super uh, flexible and still very performant uh, graph search implementation, which is an which is an essential problem in in game development. And um, yeah, we are we I, I emphasize the entity component system aspect of our games, and that is something uh, we are using Hex for. It's not the most popular choice out there. And I think this is also a reason why I want to emphasize it because uh, it has a much more easy to grasp API, I think, in, uh, in, in, in my understanding. It's much more flexible. It doesn't put too many like constraints on you. Like if I look at specs, for example, as an alternative, that's definitely something that makes you, forces you to style your, uh, your implementation in a certain way. And uh, Hex gives you much more freedom here to choose how you want to implement stuff. Cargo Lipo, I actually won't open this link this time. Uh, super important if you want to do cross-platform, especially mobile um, libraries, because it reduces the pain uh, a lot to, to, to build or cross-build uh, Mac um, or iOS libraries. That is uh, a absolute necessity to exist. Um, either, otherwise, I never would want to uh, uh, like interface with Xcode myself to be able to build the libraries. So that's definitely something I'm super thankful that it exists. And a very small um, library uh, for, uh, for simple caching. If you want to add a simple caching implementation in memory for your application server, that's something I, I used in a couple of places already. And uh, it, it, it's very small, but uh, it's, it's uh, super f um, uh, fast and, and does the job basically. And uh, it has a joke of 130 stars, even though I know a lot of people who are using it already. Um, and last but not least, um, ranking, something super important in games. <clears throat> the uh, Bayesian skill rating system implementation, I was super surprised to find it, uh, that it was already there in Rust. I, I kind of uh, uh, was afraid that I had to implement it myself. <clears throat> and um, I'm, I'm, I, I, it was one of those surprises that, uh, that really um, made my life so much easier. There's a, there's a crate for that. It does all the, the crazy math for you and you can focus on actually getting your product uh, on the street. And so that was my little selection of highlight crates that I wanted to uh, share with you. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stefan.
Interesting talk. Um, we have one question so far in the Zoom chat, and I think the person asks, um, what's tech and power? I guess it's the benchmark tool. Ah, yeah, used. that was the benchmarking uh, site that I was uh, referring to, exactly. I mean, it's uh, Actix is the clear winner, I think, in most of the categories there. Um, and so it, it, uh, yeah, it might be surprising to not use that, but um, call it personal taste or whatever. Uh, for me, Warp was much more ergonomic to use and uh, I'm kind of sticking with that because those uh, couple of milliseconds of improvements I get from Actix are not worth the hassle for me. Okay. Um, one question I got, um, do you have a comparison about the server cost? Like I mean, you talked about using Go in the past and now Rust. Do you have a comparison of I saved 200 bucks a month or something? like this yeah that is would be awesome to quantify it but that is that is super hard because i never translated as something directly basically from go to rust and uh, so the there's no direct comparison between the same product written in, in, in go and rust and to be able to compare um, but what i actually uh, what i can actually um, extrapolate based on is the the ip lookup service that i translated uh, to rust um, I don't have the numbers here right now, but that's something I wanted to write a post about anyways. Um, and there's definitely some measurable, measurable improvements that you could extrapolate into server costs then in, in the long term. Okay, cool. Um, there's one more question popping up. And one person asks, um, would you think of using Rocket again as it is about to be supported by Stable Rust? Um, I, I guess no, but that's not um, based on like uh, any facts that it's worse than warp now. But it's more like I'm happy with warp, and I, and this is totally this is totally not based on any uh, observations. But I could I would assume that the ton of uh, macros that war that rocket supports would also maybe hit the compile times a little bit. And uh, that is something that I'm already struggling with in, in my Rust projects. So I'm, I, I wouldn't, I guess, um, uh, add another crate that would heavily uh, put, put uh, their work in, into, into macros uh, and, and waste more compile time on that. Okay. And I have um, one more question. Would you recommend a beginner who is just um, starting out in game development and like in the multiplayer world to use go or or like rust or is e uh, or I'm, you have to know your way around a bit more if you use rust i think it's i think it's not a game specific question and i i my personal opinion is um i think it's hard to start out with rust um, as a first language in general no matter if you're doing games or whatever and um, yeah, it's it's hard to judge now that when you come from from a background of C plus plus and stuff. Uh, I think it's not that not that tough. But um, I think I'm in general I wouldn't uh, suggest starting out with the Rust anyway to anyone. Okay, thank you so much. This was interesting. Um, okay, people, we are going into our breakout rooms. Um, we will open. Um, four different rooms and you will get a pop-up. If you want to join, feel free to join. And if not, take a 10 minute break. We will be back five after eight and then we will have our last talk of the day. See you later. Looking forward. Okay. I hope everyone had a good time. Interesting conversations. And we are with our last speaker of today, Ryan. Hello. All right, let me share my screen. All right. So, um, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Ryan, and I'm going to be talking about a nearly 30-year-old technology today. 
so let's have some fun. We're going to be talking uh, a little bit about COM programming, um, why you probably don't care about COM and probably shouldn't care about it, but it's still fun and interesting. Um, and I'm going to talk about it to see if we can learn a little bit about things in Rust like dynamic dispatch, um, unsafe, uh, all kinds of fun low-level stuff while looking at something that's nearly 30 years old. Um, I know, I know you're probably, uh, you know, walking away and this is me right now trying to keep you here. Um, you're not a Windows programmer. You don't, certainly you're not a Windows programmer from the 1990s. You don't really care uh, about this and that's totally cool. Um, stick around, trust me, I think you'll still find it interesting even if uh, what you learned today um, or at least the specifics of what you learned today might not be directly applicable in your day today. Um, there's still some interesting tidbits in there to learn about and we're just having a little bit of fun poking around with something that's been around for a really long time. Um, a little bit about who I am uh, when I'm not uh, co-hosting this uh, meetup with Bastian. Uh, I am. Uh, I do work for Microsoft, so um, there, there is a little connection there. Um, but uh, my background is uh, definitely not in Windows. Uh, I, I have used uh, Linux and I guess Mac uh, for basically my entire programming career. Um, I'm not a Windows programmer at all, although I guess lately I've been slowly converting into one, but that's out of choice and not really out of being forced to. Um, uh, at Microsoft, uh, on my day to day, I focus on Rust. So um, everything Rust at Microsoft and our usage of Rust at, uh, at Microsoft. Um, so if you're interested in that as well, I'm happy to, to answer questions about that as well. Um, but today we're going to be talking about a, a technology that until about, uh, I'd say a little less than a year ago was completely foreign to me. I'd never heard of it before. Um, and so, um, you know, if you're in that boat as well, um, hopefully you can go on the same journey that I went on. Um, what we're going to be talking about today is about the difference between an API and an ABI. Um, and, and so if you're not familiar with the difference between these two terms, um, we'll talk about that now. Um, hopefully, if, you're, if you've programmed before, you're familiar with the term API. Um, or an application programming interface. So this is the interface of some thing in your program. Um, and if we kind of limit that down to functions, you can imagine an API of a function being how many arguments does it have? Um, you know, what are the types of the arguments? Um, things like that. Um, and really, if you think about what an API is, it's, it's really a high level construct. Um, it, when you're thinking about an API, you're not necessarily thinking about the, the bits, the ones and zeros, uh, registers, memory, stuff like that. Um, even if you're programming in a low level language like C, um, you're, you're usually not thinking about um, what register is this uh, argument going to go into. It's, uh, it's only if you go lower level than that and, and program in something uh, like assembly that you're usually worried about uh, that. And that's where the idea of an ABI comes into the application binary interface. Uh, and this binary interface is really like the nitty gritty of your function call or whatever API that we're talking about. Um, really very specific down to how does this API work? It, how it works in the actual computer is the interface's ABI. So like, let's take a, a specific thing here. What are method calls actually, or function calls uh, to be even more specific? What are they? What happens when you call a function in a program? Um, if you've never stopped to think about it before, usually uh, when you think about a function call, you're thinking about it in high level terms. Yeah, I'm passing some arguments, um, some code is getting run and then I'm getting a result back. But like, well, what actually happens when you call that function? What registers do arguments go into? What if those arguments are too big for those registers? Do we put it on the stack? Do we, does it need to go on the heap? What order do the arguments go in? If I write the, the function with argument one, argument two, argument three, um, and I have three argument registers, you know, does it go into our register one? Does argument one go into register one? Or does it go into register three in, in backwards order? 
Um, how is the return value given back to the, to the caller of the function? Um, do I put it in some special register? Do I put it on the stack? Like, these are things that when you call a function, the caller of that function and the, the callee of the function need to agree upon. Because if they don't, then things won't work. If, if the caller expects the first argument to go in and register you know, AX, and the callee of the function expects the first argument to go on the stack, you know, that doesn't make any sense. Like they have to agree upon these things. So this is important to think about and keep this in mind because at the end of the day, what we're gonna be talking about a lot in this talk is these types of questions. Um, here's a little bit of a, an example that you can see here. Um, we have two methods and this is godbolt.org for those that aren't familiar with. It's a way to write some Rust code or C code or C++ code, um, a whole bunch of languages and see the actual assembly output that comes from it. And you can do this for things like profiling and stuff like that. Um, but it's also an interesting way for us to look at different um, ABIs uh, of method calls. And so method one here, um, and I'm, I'm using the term method, even though these are clearly functions for a reason that we'll get to in a minute. Um, method one here uh, takes the same arguments as method two. It's the same exact function. So from a high level perspective, these are the exact same methods. Um, the only difference between the two is that one has this extern standard call attached to it and the other one doesn't. So in Rust parlance, the method one has the kind of default, um, the default Rust ABI. Um, and what is that actually at the end of the day? Well, it depends on what version of the compiler you are and it can change from, from um, uh, compiler version to compiler version and even from like, you know, commit to commit of the compiler. There's really no guarantee that Rust gives of exactly what the ABI of this method will be. Um, so if we need these guarantees, if we need to know exactly what that is, we have to specify uh, an actual calling convention here. Um, and if you're wondering, well, then how does Rust work if it can't agree upon it? Well, per compiler version, it does agree. So it's always the same. So if you compile a bunch of Rust code, it will have the same calling convention. But this is why, for instance, when you compile crates, you always compile your dependencies from source because um, there is no standard calling convention. Uh, and so if we were to like, you know, put up a bunch of binaries on, on crates.io and pull those down, um, who, who knows what the, the calling conventions of those would be and your code just wouldn't work. Um, and so Rust uh, on purpose does not have a standard calling convention. You have to opt into one if you need one specifically. And in here, we're, we're taking the standard call calling convention, which again has a reason that we'll look at in a second. And you can see uh, on the, the right side of the screen, particularly on the kind of second um, assembly instruction there, that one, the method one is getting, is um, reading a pointer that's passed to it in the RSI uh, register. Whereas in method two, it's reading it from the stack, RSP plus 20. So 20 bytes into the stack, it's reading from there. And so this is how these differ. Apparently structs um, that get passed in uh, if they're a certain size. Um, and the current calling convention of Rust for Rust C145, um, it will pass that uh, in, as a pointer in a register. Um, but if you standard call, it will pass it on the stack. Uh, okay. So now we know um, that that's uh, how things work, at least in Rust 1.45, and how things work for standard call calling conventions. This is the ABI of our function. We, we can see exactly what registers uh, and where our arguments are being passed. Um, cool. All right. So, uh, so why are we talking about this? Like, what was the issue? Um, well, imagine you're back in the early 90s and you're Microsoft and you're thinking, okay, we have a bunch of these old class Win32 APIs. They're kind of flat C style APIs. They're uh, APIs that for instance, Linux still uses. So, you know, you know, you could argue, hey, they should have never changed that. Linux still uses flat style APIs um, that they're C, you know, C compatible, um, kind of very all in one namespace. Um, that, that is how Windows uh, worked and still in some APIs of Windows still works. But Microsoft is like, hey, it's the 90s, we wanna do object-oriented programming um, and we wanna do it with C++. But C++, just like Rust, 
does not have a set ABI. So there is no set ABI in C++. Just like in Rust, you have to opt into it. You have to say, I want this specific calling convention. Otherwise, C++ is free to choose whatever it wants from compiler version to compiler version. And so if you were to just compile like straight C++, um, uh, one version for a library and one version for your application code, and they didn't, you know, they were different versions of the compiler, they wouldn't work with each other. And so Microsoft was like, we want to create a library once and have code that's, you know, far in the future, um, different version of C++ be able to call that with the same ABI. So how do, we want also assure that our APIs are flexible and don't require too much mem uh, manual memory management, which is a, a problem of a lot of uh, Linux APIs. For instance, you can very easily, you know, allocate a resource, forget to, uh, to clean it up and stuff like that. This is still an, an issue in, in Linux. Um, nowadays in an issue in, in, in Windows um, Win32 APIs. Um, you know, I put issue in air quotes because depending on your perspective, it's an issue, but uh, you know, I, I definitely think there's enough, there's definitely some evidence out there to, to say that, that um, developers often forget to, to clean up after themselves or to use these APIs uh, correctly. So we wanna kind of abstract that away from the developer as much as possible. So the answer, oh, is this thing called Kong. Uh, that's what they came up with in, in the 90s, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. It. So what is it exactly? And this is the thing that for a while I was struggling with. Like, if you look at the documentation, I'm sorry to whoever wrote the documentation, it's very fuzzy and unclear of exactly what Kong is. Um, basically, it's this. It's a stable binary interface. The ABI doesn't change, so they picked some ABI. Um, it's a, it's a, a programming model that's based on interfaces. And we'll look at how you declare an interface and exactly what that is. Um, and it's memory managed through reference counting. So just if you're familiar with Rust, you have RC or, or ARC, um, or you know, if you've done Object-C or Swift, um, these are languages that use reference counting. COM also uses reference counting to keep track of if a object is still being used. Um, and it's all based on a base interface called inknown that we're going to look at um, that all other interfaces inherit from. And so you can see where object-oriented programming is coming in here. You have these interfaces and they inherit from each other. So where is COM used? Like what, uh, why are we talking about this 30 years after it came out? It came out in, I think, 93 was the first year. Like, why do I care? Well, there's still, after all this time, some Windows and non-Windows APIs out there that are built on top of COM, like DirectX, Direct2D, Direct3D, DirectWrite, stuff like that. So if you're doing game programming or graphics programming on Windows, you still have to use COM exclusively, basically. Um, OLE or OLE uh, is a, a, an, an API for doing document um, sharing. I don't think it's really used a, a lot much nowadays, but um, also kind of was the, 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 the kind of introduction to the world for COM. Um, I found this out recently that core foundation plugins, so on, on Mac or on Apple platforms, use COM apparently, um, which is surprising. And then the Windows runtime, which is the kind of new flavor of APIs, newish, I mean, it's been around for 10 years now. Um, but the, the, the way that you write like, you know, modern Windows applications is using these Windows runtime and it's built on top of COM. So it's kind of a layer or several layers on top of this COM stuff. And so if you're, you're writing a C-sharp app or whatever, and you're using um, XAML or some of these, you know, modern uh, Windows uh, APIs, it's, it's using COM under the hood. Um, so how do we support COM in Rust? Like the reason that I, that we need to do this is because, hey, we probably want to work with Windows, right? Like it's it's still an operating system that gets a ton of users. We wanna be able to use it and a lot of their APIs require COM. So how do we should have good support for it in Rust so that we can take advantage of this stuff so that we can write things like Direct2D applications, Direct3D applications, like you know AAA games, for instance, use, use these things. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we need a way in Rust to declare in interfaces, to correctly call interface methods, methods on these interfaces to correctly hook into the memory management model that COM deals with and to implement these COM classes, which are the like objects that implement the interfaces. So when you as a client are calling these interface methods, there's some object in memory that actually 
receives that method call and does the business logic with it. So we need all of this stuff and more, but we won't talk about the more uh, today. So let's look at declaring interfaces. What does that look like? Well, this is, uh, again, this is a, a, a crate that I'm uh, working on now um, called uh, COM. Uh, you can find it on crates.io under COM. Um, and this is how you declare an interface. And here we're declaring an interface called iAnimal. And it has two methods on it. It can eat some food um, and it can give you its happiness as a U size. So it can tell you how happy it is. Um, and this is, you'll, you'll notice it's a bit of a funny syntax here. You have this like UUID thing. That's because you can get interfaces by a unique identifier string. So we have to, to do that. That's the part we won't talk about. Um, and we're passing like a, a pointer to food. That's because like, we're really talking about low level things. This has to be kind of C ABI compatible. So you can't just, um, you can't pass like a, a, a vector, a rust vector in there because that the, the ABI of a rest vector, its layout and memory is not, is not set in stone. So it could change from uh, compiler version to compiler version. So we have to be very careful about what we pass across this API layer. But this is what it looks like kind of in a, a rough way. We're declaring an interface, iAnimal, it inherits from iUnknown, which we'll look at in a second. It can eat food and it can give you its happiness. That's, that's what it looks like here. Um, and then we have an interface called iUnknown that, that all other interfaces inherit from here. And it has three methods on it. And these are the three kind of like, this is, if you want to understand com, this is what it, it's all about. The first one, we'll skip the first one for a second, query interface. The, first, the next two are, have to do with its memory management model. So add reference is basically increasing its reference count and release is decrementing its reference count. So every time that you get a new kind of handle on an interface, you need to call add ref. Um, and if you um, no longer are using the handle, you need to call release. Um, and so hopefully in your head, you're thinking, hey, that sounds a lot like, you know, clone and drop. So I, we'll see in a second, add ref will be called every time we clone an interface and release will be called every time we drop an interface. And query interface is to say, given a certain interface and its ID, the UUID that you see on the screen there um, for, the, for some given interface, is the interface that I have here compatible with this other interface? And I kind of like convert it into it. So like dynamically at runtime, I can just provide an ID for an interface and optionally get that interface from, uh, from another interface. And you know, if it doesn't support that interface because it doesn't implement that interface, then it just returns a, you know, a negative result basically. So that's I am known. So now we have to figure out how do we actually do interface method calling? And this is where like, this is generated code right here. You won't actually write this. All that we looked at before, that, that macro that we looked at before is, is implementing this for you. And you can see that an iAnimal interface is just a pointer to a V table pointer. So there's a little bit of indirection in there on line seven. You have a non-null pointer that points to another pointer, which points to some, a V table. And so if you're familiar with, with dynamic dispatch, this is what dynamic dispatch is all about. We're going to a V table, um, a, a, a virtual table where we actually dispatch our, our method. Great. So um, you can take a look at the code here. We're basically just doing a bunch of like low level um, casting and, and pointer dereferencing and stuff like that to call into our methods uh, in our V table. Um, and here, here I, I added a, a little bit to, so you can see it better, sorry that I didn't use that before. And this is what a V table looks like. You have the iAnimal V table has its parent V table in it at the beginning of it and the eat and happiness um, methods in it as well. And notice there that it's using the standard call function that we saw here. So we know exactly when we call this function, it will pass the arguments exactly how we expect to pass, and we'll get the return arguments exact, exactly how we expect. So we're, we're good to go there. And again, rep C is important too, because this all has to be like baked in scone exactly how it will be in memory. Um, memory management, uh, real quick, we said it before, on when we drop the iAnimal interface, it's gonna call release um, on the iUnknown uh, interface. So that just decrements the, the pointer. And of course, the, the backing implementation, when the reference count reaches zero, the whole thing will be freed um, because it's not used anymore. 
And on clone, we're calling add ref. So every time we clone a handle to our, our interface, we add a reference to it. And this is how memory is managed. So you can you basically can be assured that as long as you have a, a um, an I animal, that it's it has valid uh, it has valid memory because we're we're only getting another one if we clone, and we're and adding ref, and we're only releasing it when we drop the thing and we no longer use it. And then real quick, exposing a class looks like this. So we're basically doing the reverse, where we declare the implementing class. In this case, our animal is a lion. And we have to implement the, the eat and happiness methods on it here. And what the macro, the class bang macro does is basically in reverse, implement a vtable that when it gets called, it will call our, our eat and our happiness methods for us. And so everything kind of lines up. The client can call into a vtable, the class implements that vtable, and when the client calls through that vtable, it will go to the implementation that's done here. And everything lines up because the ABIs are, are set, everything is kind of ex is set in stone exactly how it will be in memory. And we're done. Yay. That's it. Not really. There's a whole bunch of other, you know, cruft and, and com is actually super complicated. Um, so, you know, if this is weirdly, strangely interesting to you, you can get lost uh, in it. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there, like registering classes, class factories, blah, 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 blah. We're not going to get into any of that. Um, we just looked at kind of the core low level thing of how we call into um, a, an interface and how we implement that interface. And this is what it looks like in real life. Here's a, some direct 2D code being called in here. It's um, for an app that I'm working on right now that is not finished. Um, this is what it, it looks like right now. Eventually it will be a clock that will go around. It's not done. I didn't know I was giving this talk today, so sorry for the un, unfinished clock. Um, if you're interested in, uh, in looking into this, uh, Windows programming, weird 30-year-old uh, interfaces and stuff like that, come, come join us. You'll notice um, down below it says COM has been superseded by WinRT, Windows Runtime, which is true. If in, you should probably not use COM unless you have to, which is for Direct2D the case. Um, you should use instead WinRT, which I said before is built on top of of COM. And the great thing about WinRT, COM is very unsafe. You can screw things up and stuff like that. WinRT is built on top of metadata that as long as the metadata is, is good, you can build completely safe APIs. And so we can build rather idiomatic REST APIs that just directly call into Windows um, for us. And it's all machine generated, which is super great. COM, on the other hand, has to be implemented or declared by hand, which is a real bummer. Um, this is what WinRT looks like. So you're importing some namespaces and then you get safe, real safe code uh, that you can call in here. Um, and it's all built on a foundation of this gnarly unsafe uh, com that we just looked at, but it's uh, because of the metadata safe to, to call. All right. And that was a whirlwind tour of a 30 year old technology. Um, and here's awkward Bill Gates dancing. So if you have any questions, let me know. Amazing. Super nice talk. There was no paint or minesweeper, but that's <laughs> Which, okay. Which, by the way, we probably do use COM <laughs> inside of them. So now you know how they work. <laughs> no, super, super nice talk. Um, we have um, a few questions. We have a comment. Uh, like a random node, um, Firefox is using XPCOM, the XROS platform, the cross-platform component object model pretty similar to Microsoft COM. And yes, yes. we can implement XPCOM objects in Rust. Yes, link. and and it would be uh, hopefully at some point uh, like COM on Linux, which is still used, uh, for instance, um, and and for the stuff in Firefox, you should be able to use the ComRAS. Uh, create for that as well. So maybe we can start consolidating the, the community a little bit so there's not a ton of different implementations, but right now it's all, it assumes Windows for now. So that's, okay. I gotta work on that. Okay, wow, well, there are more and more questions. Um, I pick a few. Um, does it support method overriding? 
does com support method overloading? Um, I believe it does, or it should in languages that support overloading. You would, because the methods, the names of the methods don't, don't actually matter. It's just their place in the V table. And so we have a mapping in our Rust code that says like the eat function on I animal is like the second method in the V table. And so if the backing class that implements that calls it, you know, foobar instead of eat, doesn't matter as long as it is just, it has the same signature and it's in the same place in the V table. And so you could in theory have multiple uh, methods name the same thing as long as they dispatch to two places in, uh, in the V table. But of course, Rust can't support that because Rust doesn't support overloading. So you'd have to give them different names, but yeah. Cool. Next question is, um, does, does the new win UI use COM2? So when UI uses WinRT under the hood. Um, and so if you're interested in when UI, then contribute to the WinRT project. And because WinRT uses COM under the hood, then yes, when UI uses COM at the end of the day. Um, we are working on, there's a whole bunch of things in addition to COM, basic COM support and basic WinRT support that are needed for WinUI and we're working towards that. So yes, eventually you will be able to write WinUI Windows applications uh, in Rust and just plain, hopefully rather idiomatic uh, Rust. So come join, help us build that. That sounds a reason to get a, like a Windows laptop soon again. Yeah. And I pick one more. Um, what's the plan at Microsoft to use run Rust on com interface? I think you just answered this. Yeah, there's a whole, uh, I mean, we want to start using more and more Rust at Microsoft and a bunch of our, obviously our external APIs are com based and internal APIs that, um, you know, outside developers don't ever see are also com based. And so, um, and we have a bunch of technology that we definitely are still very much investing in. That's like, like WinRT, for instance, it's built on top of COM. So this is all like, so COM itself isn't used very much nowadays, but like it's still being used by other technologies that wrap it. And those are super important to the Windows uh, ecosystem, so. Okay, and then let's ask the last, the last one too, Emma. Are you also planning to add a layer on top of COM RS that makes it safe? So I tried to do this and it's just not possible because, and that's the difference between WinRT and COM. There's basically just not enough information that you have from, um, from a COM interface um, that would make it safe. Now, if you, we might add a layer to COMRS that would allow you, if you're writing a interface in Rust and the backing implementation is in Rust, that you can assume that it's safe and maybe we'll add some support there. Um, but, but really there's just, there's not enough information to know whether what you're doing is fully safe according to, uh, to the Rust um, runtime. Um, there are some things that will definitely make it safer to use. For instance, we're working um, in the, um, uh, sorry, in the safe transmute working group, which uh, I'm in, in order to um, better be able to declare types as having certain layouts in memory um, uh, with the type system. So, so being able to say in the type system, this type has a stable layout. Um, it, you know, is this big, it's, it has this, uh, alignment, blah, blah, blah. You can't talk about in the, in the type system today uh, about those ideas. We're going to make it so that you can, and then we can encode that in some of these APIs and make it so that's harder and harder to screw up the calm API. But I don't think we'll ever get to a point where we can make it fully where you don't have to write unsafe because um, there's just not enough info to know that. But hopefully, you know, it'll be very hard to make a mistake that will crash your computer at some point. That makes sense. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and there is a little like announcement from Cisha and there's no 
rust and tell without the gun. So let's, <laughs> I, I let's think let him now... talk at least for a minute. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, tell us no. how you feel and what you're up to <laughs> and share some stories uh, with us. No, no, I'm blushing. Um, <laughs> um, no. Um, it's just that I wanted to announce that I've been talking a lot about Zebus in, in some presentations in, in this um, uh, Rust and Tell. So um, we finally, finally released 1.0 um, a week ago. Um, so if anyone wants to try it out, please do and let us know if there's any problems. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. We will try it out. And there is the link in the Zoom chat for people who want to see it. Cool. Well, if there, are any, if there are any last questions from anyone, feel free to talk. And if not, we see you in August, last Tuesday of the month, as always. Feel free to get in touch with Brian or me to give a talk. You can just talk. You don't even have to have slides or something. Just share your ideas, your code, browser tabs are fine. Just feel free to take this as your first step into the talk, speak, Rust world. Okay. Thank you so much, people. See you Bye. next month. Thank you so much. Bye.